Call Me Homer, Mike Green, Bob Harlan, Bud Sealing, and George Carl. Joining us now is Mike Green. Good afternoon. Tony, is that true that, that only four people refused to call him Homer? Uh, I've heard other names besides Homer and Steve. <laughs> my, my wife, too, but she doesn't count. Uh, they're not good names. I won't repeat them on the air, Mike. A student in her class once asked if he could call her Mrs. Homer. <laughs> I can't tell you what she said. All right. Now, you call him. I, I, call, him El, I call him El Cheapo, Mike. <laughs> Ah. He wouldn't know. He's yeah, he's super cheap. I, in case no, you didn't know. I don't, I don't think I've Has ever he ever taken you out to no, lunch no, or dinner I've or something? Never, I've never paid a penny going out with Mike Brain that I'm aware of. He it hasn't happened that often. No, wait, I might have paid for him when he was, was in Yeah, I paid for What was that tents. great breakfast place we went to? Yeah. yeah. He came no, he, he 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 has he has free he has free credit there, so that doesn't count. He didn't really pay for it. Never mind. All right. No, he had, he had coupons that he used that day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no question. Yeah. Um, you got some award for a hundred finals games. Do I have that right? Tell us the specifics. Um, I didn't get an award. I just they somebody actually figured it out that I had, the last game, game five of the finals, was the hundredth finals game that I had called. So wow. it was just a nice little recognition, and it's a hard to believe recognition, quite frankly. All right, so you've done a hundred. Tell us about Jokic and what stands out to you. There's no muscle on his body. He he's, he doesn't look athletic, and he's spectacularly good. He's, I think he's the most unique player I've ever seen. And the beauty of him, all he wants to do is play with his teammates, win a game, and go home to his family. He, he's so disinterested in, in being in the spotlight. He doesn't want to really have to answer questions. But when he does, he's delightful. He's funny. Um, he's just an old-fashioned basketball player who could play in any era. He could have played in the 50s. He could play in the 70s, the 90s, and today he's just, he's not only has magnificent skills for a man his size, but he's one of the smartest players and just thinks the game so well. I, I could watch him play all night. There, there's some, see, there's some comparisons to Tim Duncan, you know, and there's some parts of them that are very different, but they're both the same. They're these humble superstars who enjoy their their teammates success more than their own and they just want to win every night they step on the floor yeah uh, denver certainly uh looks to be tough how long do you think they can uh keep that level up and how long are they going to keep it together i know people are throwing the dynasty word around but uh with their first one uh how long do you think they can be in the mix and keep that crew together well tony anybody anybody that uses the word dynasty after one championship should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> right. Uh, Steve, Steve didn't use the word dynasty, did he? <laughs> I no, of, he did I not. thought about it. No, okay. All right, good. Um, listen, they, they have this amazing player, uh, and they had the right people around them, so they're certainly going to be one of the favorites next year, although, you know, they could lose a fellow. Uh, Bruce Brown might sign yep. with another team. He was an integral part. Uh, but this year, they're... You know, I think the reason this year was so fun was because it, it was unpredictable. There were so many teams that you could thought had a chance at the championship. So it's not going to be easy um, because they were the best team in basketball. Were they head and shoulders the best team? I don't know. Um, but they certainly were the best team, and they proved it. But it's going to be hard to come back and repeat. Ask any, even even the dy dynasty teams. Uh, the road in the in the second and the third championship is so difficult. So it's way too early to even think about that because you don't know who's going to be on the rosters with free agencies and trades, uh, which will probably start happening in the next couple of days. Talking with Mike Brain, if you don't know who he is, you're listening to the wrong station. All right, Jokic, because I can ask 100 questions about it. What have you ever seen that made him mad? And of all that he does, what do you sense that he enjoys the most? Well, the interesting thing, Steve, is when he first started playing in the league, he let calls or non-calls really affect him and impact him. He'd get mad, and it would, in some ways, impact his performance. And that's one of the, the real growths of his game from when he first came into the league, is that he doesn't let it bother him. He just plays through it, uh, and he, and he kind of keeps an, uh, an even-keeled demeanor. 
Um, the other, of course, was has how he went from being out of shape to being in incredible shape. So I think that's one area. Although he did get really mad in Game Five at one point, we we had a close up of the bench, and he was furious uh, at his players. And you know, it's one of those things where he doesn't say these things often, but when he does, everybody sits up and pays attention. And and that's the kind of leadership he brings. He doesn't he doesn't speak up often, but when he does, it, it has a, a huge impact. Mark, I want to. I got to ask about the local question. team, the Bucks. Oh, oh sorry. Steve, did you have a second part of that question that I failed to answer? Move on. Tony's question's better. I can hold off for a second. Yeah, I, I just want to ask about the, the local team, the Bucks, and how, you know, I know they were disappointed with the way this year ended. Uh, they caught a hot Miami team, and, and they themselves didn't play the greatest. But looking at the team, I know some guys opted out of some stuff, and I'm, I'm hoping that's so they can restructure. But what, what else do you think they need to add? I, I'm not sure myself if running it back is, is going to be good enough. Uh, but I'm not sure also well, like, what they need to add. Well, Tony, it's, it's going to be interesting when you have a coaching change, especially a coaching change that involves letting go a championship coach. Um, you have to find out first if the new head coach is going to tweak the way they play a little bit. And that, right. um, that might have a huge impact in terms of who they pursue in free agency. Um, you know, the whole Chris Middleton thing. What's going to happen with Chris Middleton? There's so many question marks, but you can you can mark it down. They will be one of the favorites in the East um, because of, obviously, Giannis and the rest of the core players that they have there with, you know, Holiday and, and Pat Connaughton and, and Bobby Portis. But they could lose a couple of key guys, and how they replace them is going to go a long way. And again, how the new coach is going to, is he going to modify a little bit the way, the style that they play? Is he going to stay, play the same way? So many questions. It's going to be fascinating to see. But a lot of teams are going to be going through that. Even some of the top teams, right. as we've seen with Boston. Boston made a major trade by getting rid of Marcus Smart. So um, it might be another one of those years where, you know, the elite teams will stay elite, but it's going to be so unpredictable because you, you, you don't know all the changes that's going to be happening and how it's going to impact the individual teams. Tiger and Mike Green, do you remember, back to Jokic, uh, do you remember who the first person was that said, you won't believe how good this guy's going to be? I mean, it wasn't at the start. He was the 41st pick, the greatest draft choice in the history of the NBA. Um, but... No. First, first off, you're obsessed. You're obsessed with this boy. Yes. Oh, I like that. Yes. I love the passion. Yes. I hear the passion in your voice. He he gets like that. Um, you could you could make a claim that it's the it's the greatest draft pick uh, from the yes. standpoint of where he was taken because no, he's the highest draft pick to ever win an MVP. Yeah. Um, and now to Dallas to, was to mention 15, it with but it's nothing compared exactly to it. exactly. Um, yeah. You know, even back in in uh, in his rookie year, he started having games where you're like, "Wow!" But he just never looked like he he would have the ability to do it night in and night out. He showed flashes, but because he wasn't in great condition, he couldn't do it all the time. I, I don't know the first person that said this guy is he's the best player in the game or he's got a chance to be spectacular. Uh, I'm sure there were a number of people that spotted that talent early and said, he's not just going to be good, he's going to be great. I, I can't pinpoint the first person I heard say that. Um, but it wasn't an easy climb. Like, he, he wasn't an instant star. He had to work on his game. Um, his rookie year, he asked out of the starting lineup because he, he felt he wasn't a good fit with Nurkic, who was the starting center at the time. <clears throat> so, you know, it wasn't just his, his skill level, learn how to play in the NBA. The conditioning thing, again, is huge. Um, and, and to me, those are the stories that are great because he wasn't great because he was given these, these God-given abilities, certainly some of them. But he had to work to get to this level, and he had to work really hard to get to this level. And he's the first one also to tell you he's gotten to this level because of players and coaches around him. And that's that was one of the beautiful things about Denver this year is that they, they surrounded him with players that seemed to be the perfect fit for a player like Jokic. I may have missed it, but I am curious if I did, what Jeff Van Gundy said at any point, like, how do you defend him? What's the best way? There was talk about um, giving him the shots. I think that lasted one game or, um, but is there, 
any best way, even if it doesn't work? Well, clearly there wasn't one. There wasn't one this year. Right. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is you know, he's so unselfish. So his preference, he would rather have a 15 assist game than a 30 point game. So his unselfishness is something that you know really makes his teammates around him better. Makes it you know five against five as opposed to just one. A couple of the the, the highest scoring games he had in the playoffs were a couple of the few games that they actually lost. But he also recognizes that there are some nights that they're going to let him score and he's going to take full advantage of it because, first off, he can. And second of all, again, his number one priority every night is to win. So I think I don't think there's one clear-cut way. It depends upon your personnel. But I do think some teams are leaning towards, you know what, let him score, let him have his. We just can't let anybody else get off during a game. Talking with Mike Green. I, I, I got, I got Where's the honest. restaurant you guys are at, by the way? No, we're at no, Summerfest. We're, we're at the, the, we're music, at the festival, Summerfest. Festival. Yeah, we're just out by oh, the lake. It's about to rain. Oh, okay. It's about to storm on us. You should come. You would enjoy it. Uh, but I just got to say this. It sounds fun. It, it is fun. But I got to say this. I'm, I'm going to squill first chance I get on Homer because we're talking to the great Mike Green. And I'm going to let my friend Giannis know that all you talked about was Jokic. Yeah. That's right. I'm going to tell him. He didn't say one word about you, Giannis. All he did was gloat over Jokic. You know what? I'm just going to let it be known. Yeah, you tell Giannis he got to figure out how to handle this guy or they're not winning another right. title. I'm going to tell him, all right. And the information I get tell from him, Mike right. Green might help. The only thing I want to talk more than, uh, than, than about Jokic is Mike Green, but he doesn't like to talk about himself, <laughs> so it becomes difficult. I don't want to ask you about your fire if you haven't talked about it. I mean, and I don't even know for sure that it's accurate. <laughs> What's accurate? The fire or that I don't want well, to talk your about? House, it? Your house burnt down. That, I won't break, keep talking about it. your house burnt down. Is that right? Yes, that happened back in September. Oh, okay. Everything's okay now. Everything's okay. We're nobody was home at the time, and we received an amazing amount of kindness and support. So it's um, it worked out just wonderfully. Thank you. Although did you check, the, did you check Homer's the original the edition time? of <laughs> the the original uh, copy of Frankie the Squirrel was destroyed. Yeah, for, oh. uh, that brings up my second point. Oh, Thanks go. for bringing it up. No, that's his Wikipedia page. I continue to try to improve it. It, it the this, this stuff with your personal life. We need to add something, but you're not going to agree to that. 1985, you were the play-by-play -play voice of Marist College Red Fox. It sounds like that was your first play-by-play -play job, but I would like to add to your page your first play-by-play -play game of any sport? Well, first of all, Maris was not my first play-by-play -play job. I was oh. actually the analyst on those Maris telecasts. The play-by-play -play guy was a fellow by the name of Dean Garland, who was so good at his job, and I learned so much from working alongside him. But, you know, they, they couldn't pay a, a former coach to be an analyst on those local broadcasts, so they hired somebody cheap, which was me, and it was a great experience for me just being on the air, but also to learn from, from a, an excellent play-by-play -play guy in Dean Darling. And so what was your first, what's the first play-by-play -play game you ever did? I know you remember. Ever did was when I, oh yeah, I was in college, and it was for the Fordham University radio station, WFUV, and um, a woman named Ann Gregory, that was her name at the time, uh, she scored 39 points in Fordham 1. Mm. And Gregory wound up later on marrying um, somebody who became my best friend, Jim O'Connell, better known as Doc, who was one of the finest college basketball writers in the history of journalism. And and the first of I met Ann was the time I watched her score 39 at the Rose Hill Gym at Fordham University. That's my first yeah! one. All I got to do is, because they won't let me take it from the show, all I got to do is find some story somewhere, and that will be added to, to your Wikipedia page. Frankie the Squirrel, the book, uh, is no longer a part of it. Um, and, you'll, Tony, this is for you, that, you know, Mike Breen and I have something in common that I didn't know, because I always want to find things. What do you think Mike Breen and I have in common? Uh, you're both white guys. <laughs> that wasn't in his Wikipedia page. That's but it's close. It. We're both Catholic. Oh, okay. Uh, 
I thought that was the first time I saw that in your Wikipedia page. I know you don't have necessarily any comment about that. Um, and he's probably I didn't know you were Catholic. I uh, see, and I didn't know you were Catholic, so I can say. Are you I'm saying that because he doesn't act Catholic, or no? Saying that because I'm always <laughs> looking for comparisons. Acting unholy. That I, that I have oh. with uh, Mike Breen, and now I know that I have one. All right, Tony. I can guarantee you we're two flawed. We're two very flawed Catholics. <laughs> yeah, I, I know he you. is. Huh? I, I did not know you were, but now I, I do. Thank you. That. Thank you for your honesty, Mike. That's something that's not too common around here. I appreciate the time. We'll do it again. But you should consider Summerfest. I'm sure you're a big music fan, right? Different. Uh, oh, cra crazy, crazy. Well, all right, give me, all right, give me your, your favorite artist. Mine? You should probably tell me. Yeah. Mine would, would have to be, um, uh, I saw Elton John in 1972. That's probably, that, 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 that's my fit most oh, famous, wow. famous thing. He was just the first trip over here. I said, that guy's going to be good. Wow. Um, my favorite uh, Elton John song be... is was my wedding. It was my wedding song. Oh, nice! Wow! Your, Another your thing song. in common with yeah. Mike Green. We're on a roll. Uh, it would have to be Bruce Springsteen. I, I the first concert I saw him was like 1970 something. I, I couldn't believe the energy. Everything. I mean, I can't. Uh, there were probably others that are equal. It was just the whole event and the energy. I did, I couldn't comprehend it. People were that crazy. How many times have you seen him? Uh, not that many. I don't know. Maybe three or four. Why? Well, you're probably not a, you're not a big concert guy. No, I'm not. There's you're like how many stages are there? There are, there are like five or six stages here, Mike. This thing is huge. Yeah. They're all over the place. How many? Uh, What's the headline? Who's the headliner? Uh, depends on what stage. Like I say, everybody, every stage has its own headliner. They're placed throughout the park, so pretty good setup here. Yeah, you, it's, it's a long, it's design. a long stretch of, it's a long stretch of lakefront. It's and one of it's just, the greatest music festivals on the planet Earth. It's, it's, I think it's the largest. That's. Yeah, we could get. Is it tickets. bigger than Jazz Fest in the world? Yes. Yes, I think so. Pretty sure wow. it's the biggest. Oh, All right, back to your number of concerts. I bet you got Bruce Springsteen. You might be at fifty. Concerts? Uh, oh, yeah, just, yeah. just shy of, just shy. Probably around forty-four, wow. forty-five. All right, who's second? Billy Joel. Yes, that's a great guess. Wow. Well, Billy Joel, I like Billy Joel. Come on with that. Because at Madison Square Garden, he's been, uh, he's been, he's been stalking your Wikipedia. Yeah, Trust right. me. It's not, those things aren't on it. But they will be in the future if I can find it at another article. When, when he gets obsessed, he researches like there's no tomorrow. I will not put the fire um, in the house, though. That, that's not going to be in there. That, nobody has any need. Tony, you're, you're in charge of keeping an eye on him. I know that's a difficult huh. job. <laughs> All right, so difficult. other than, I'm, and I got Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel. Who's next? There's got to be someone else. Uh, you know what? Uh, you know what I'm really into now? Film music, like uh, Thomas Newman and Hans Zimmer and John Williams. Oh. Those are amongst my favorites. Ooh, I thought you were going Love Steely Dan. Dan. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This has been a fabulous interview, both for the, all the information you gave about Jokic, so that we get that along to Giannis to help him figure out how to stop him, and for the, all the additions I can make. And when they're added to your Wikipedia page, you can be sure that I'm the one behind it. So, I, I just want to make you happy. <laughs> wow. Well, it will. It will. Oh. Well, actually, what Next would make me the happiest on me. if No, no. If you would say, <laughs> Homer, this was a great interview. Homer, this is one of the greatest interviews I've ever been a part of. Yeah! <laughs> no more Jokic questions. Thanks, Mike. We'll do it again next year after the finals. All right, Steve. Maybe. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> All right, see you, Mike. <laughs> I don't know why you made the guy lie like that. It's rude. It's not bad enough that you lie. Now it's you're making our guests lie. It's true. I was surprised he did. That's how nice he is. Mm. Next. You're listening to Homer and Tony live from the Gruber Law Office's Sports Zone.